Hello friends, Pastor Brinson here. First, I wanna just thank you for tuning in to this week's message. I think technology is so amazing. Whether you're downloading or streaming this message, I pray that it blesses you. And if you want any more information, or if you want to consider donating to our ministry to help resources at Journey Church, go and log on to journeychurch.org. Now, get ready, get your notes ready, get your coffee ready, and get stirred up for the Holy Spirit to speak to you through this week's message. Good morning and welcome once again to Journey Church. God bless you guys. Sorry to break up your fellowship. Wow, you guys are having a great time. Come on, Jesus. Can you hear me now? You got me? All right, good. You guys are having a great time. God bless you. Thank you for being here. If we've not met, my name's Eric, and it is my pleasure to welcome you. To those of you who are online, we welcome you as well. Thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us today. Uh, the, the only announcements I got today, I don't know where Mary Jo went, if she's still in here or not, but she's hiding as far, okay, I thought she was as far back as she could possibly do. Today's our 29th anniversary, We're 30 years. She's put up with me for all those years. Do you believe it? Give her the Saint of the Year Award. So we are, yeah, we love you, honey. And uh, yeah, we're celebrating 29 years anniversary today. So it's a great day. Um, God is good. God is very good. Uh, a couple other things with our family. For whatever reason, it's been a pretty hard month on us for animals. You know, uh, I don't want to get emotional. It's weird feeling emotional about it. But uh, we lost a dog a couple months ago. Not a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago. We lost our 14-year-old lab. And uh, she was a great joy to have with us for all those years. And then this week, it was kind of strange. But uh, we, our little dog, Lola, ended up running away on Thursday night. If you were around town Thursday night, the, uh, the weather was really bad. I mean, it was lightning and thundering quite significantly that night. And she happens to be very scared when, when lightning and thunder comes. And we have a sunroom where the dogs usually stay in when we're away. And they have some freedom where they can go inside and outside of the house um, so that we don't have a mess to come home to, you know. So uh, I think maybe with Sadie not being there and then it so happened that somehow we locked our little white dog into the house, she ended up being out there alone. So she was scared when the thunder and lightning came and ran off, you know, so we were pretty freaked out. We got home and she's done that once or twice before, but always came back very quickly and, uh, you know, relieved us at that point. But that night she didn't come home. And, you know, thanks to many great friends, it was so neat to see, you know, a community kind of rise up as we posted it on Facebook and we're running all around and putting up signs and posters and telling everybody that we know and people were kind enough to reshare on Facebook and we went into kind of night two and she still hadn't come back. So it was looking a little bit even more grim at that point, like, oh my gosh, what is this little dog doing? A, you know, a 12 pound little dog out there in Clay Hill. I mean, stuff's rough out there on the farm, let me tell you. And uh, you know, for her to be gone, it's just scary for any of us when things like that happen. And then we woke up yesterday morning and a neighbor about a mile away um, had seen a dog that looked much like ours. So we went out there with the uh, golf cart and we're running around and we're yelling for and yelling for. So I have half a voice today um, and she didn't respond. So again, you know, Mary Jo is crushed. I'm crushed. It's sad for the past uh, eight years, little Lola would pretty much sleep in our bed and curl up at the top of the, our, our head. And she's just a beautiful little dog. And then a little bit later on during the day, we get a call from that same lady and she's like, I think I see your dog. And she, she had it. And, um, you know, Jim was there with me and some others were out there helping us. And it was so gracious to go up there. And then you, we, uh, I pull up to the yard and we see her out there in the yard and she's so scared. She's out there shaking. You know, this is like a designer dog. You know, she's not supposed to be out there in the woods. This is not good. You know, I mean, she's like that big. So, uh, you know, she's shaking. She couldn't even recognize me. I run up to her and I'm calling her name and she's all freaked out. And then finally she gets up in my arms and, you know, then Mary Jo sees her and she breaks apart and falls apart and starts crying. And, it, it, you know, there's great joy in finding something that's lost like that because the, our pets, our family members, our loved ones, they all mean just such a great deal to us. And then the Lord certainly began to bring me back to scripture with regards to that. And, you know, what does that mean in that bigger sense? So, you know, it, it, you come across the parable of the lost coin and it says, 
Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, I found that lost coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The story kind of changes real quick with that last sentence, doesn't it? You know, he's not talking about a coin. He's not talking about a dog. He's talking about a human being who is lost. A human being who's out there, you know, we picked her up and she had ticks all over her when we got her, you know. She's out there in the bushes. She's out there lost. She's out there wet. She's out there drenched. And I can't help but think how many people in our own lives are like that. People that we love very dearly, our brothers, our sisters, our sons, our daughters, those who are wayward, those who are lost, those who are far from God. And I think about the response that we saw in the natural over this little dog that most people didn't even know. And we posted it out there and people reposted it and they aggressively went after doing whatever they can to see this dog come to light so much so that a lady that we didn't even know a mile away ended up seeing posts from other people and ended up calling us that she had found this dog. What if we went after those who are lost in our life in the same way, with that same sense of aggression, with that same sense of you know, fervor? What if we saw every empty seat that surrounds us like that empty pillow on the bed where that dog lied at night? That person who you love that should be sitting there next to you, what are you gonna do to go out there and reach them? What are you gonna do to go out there and tell them that they're loved by the God of the universe? That he loves them so much that he would die for them. See, Journey, when we're talking Vision 365, there are lost, hurting people all around us, and all too often we walk through life with blinders. Sometimes we don't even wanna see them, right? I won't be hanging around that flea-infested joker of a friend that I got, right? But man, what could happen in their life if Jesus was to intervene? And in fact, we got a great jump start on Vision 365 this week. Do you know, between youth and adults this past week, we saw 28 people give their lives to the Lord, most of those young people during our, ser our, our, our service on Wednesday night. 20 young people came to know Jesus. They came here maybe for the Ulta stuff, whatever that is, right? You ladies know better than I do. They came here because of the gifts. They came here to hear rappers. They came here for whatever reason motivated them to show up. And they got here and they heard about this Jesus who loves them. And they ended up surrendering their life to the king of the universe. Lord, would you instill that same kind of a passion in our heart for those who we love Father, would we see them as you see them, those who are lost, those who are hurting, those who the storms of life and the thunder and lightning fall upon and they run out scurrying into the streets and they misbehave and they act strange and they act like people that we maybe don't want to be around at times. Would you give us a love for those kinds of people, Lord Jesus? Father, as we gaze upon seats that are around us that remain empty, Lord Jesus, would you use those as opportunities? Would you remind us during the course of the week about people who you want to see come to know you? And could we join with the chorus of angels as described in the verse that we just read in rejoicing over every lost one who is saved? Lord, you are our king. You are what really matters in life. And today as we conclude this worship series, Lord God, would you just recreate in our hearts if we've lost it in some way, that sense of awe of who you really are, that sense of wonder that you are the God of the universe who threw and slung the stars into the heavens and made cells divide to form a baby out of nothingness, oh God. You are the one who is worthy to be worshiped. And as a result of that worship, may we live a life on mission never forgetting where you brought us from and continually challenging us to go into all the world and preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen, amen, and amen? Let's get into the meat of today's message. There's a verse that you're very familiar with. We're gonna dive into it in just a moment. If you've been around Journey any, any length of time, we're gonna talk about the matter of first importance in life today. What is the most important thing to you? Let's start with that question. Why don't we go there from the beginning? What's the most important thing to you in your life? Is it your job? Is it your wife? 
Is it your children? Is it money? Is it a car? What is the most important thing in your life? Maybe even for some of you, it's something like an addiction right now. I know at a point in my life, the most important thing to me, sadly, was fueling my addiction. It had hold of me. It had taken over every aspect of my life, and it was the thing I worshipped, while I never would have even said I was worshipping, and it was, it was what I was worshipping. That was fueling my life at that particular season. How do you begin to tell? What consumes your thought life? What do you think about? Do you think about God when you wake up? Do you think about diving in his word? Do you think about spending time with other believers in fellowship? Do you think about going to church? You did this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. So it is up there definitely on the list of people who are here today. You think about Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather and talk more about them than we do about our God and King. Last night, Facebook was blowing up, right? I woke up at one in the morning, saw little Lola there, hallelujah, Jesus, and then I turned back over and picked up the phone to see who won that fight. So I'm susceptible to these kinds of things as well, right? All of us are. These temptations of the world, they want to draw us in. They want to take our time. Sometimes they want to bring us good um, experiences and happiness and joy, and there's nothing wrong with those things when they're in perfect balance, right? But if they take over and they consume things, they become what we talked about last week, idols in our life, and those idols need to be stepped on, gone against, so that we don't fall into worshiping false gods. I think deep down, we all know that number one should be our relationship with Christ. Our identity and mission in life is found in how we see God and how we relate to God. That's where we find our worth. That's how we discover who we really are. I walked back, Kevin, Kevin obviously gets this. I don't think he's back there right now, but it was funny. I walked back there and I joke with the sound guys and others at times. And I said, man, you sound guys are just terrible, you know. Walked back there and he goes, I am so glad my identity is not found in you. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> He knew I was joking, obviously, but he gets the gospel aspect of that. His identity is grounded and founded in his relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not found in any affirmation that I may or may not give him. In fact, it's not found in any way that uh, we can perform or anything that we can pretend about either in trying to present our best image to the world around us, right? Our image, our identity is grounded and founded in our relationship with God, Maybe we should be, if we're not, seeking after him for those nuggets in life as if we were going after that lost dog, right? Spending time posting about it. How do I learn about this? How do I know more about God? Would you tell me more about this? What does this verse mean? How can I know who he is? Would we spend time together? Would you help me go find him, right? What if we spent our life in understanding that's what real life was about into eternity, not just the temporal, which seems to command so much of our attention, does it not? God's showing us a different way. He reminds us, and I think he has to do it often, of what's really important because I've said it here way too often, maybe like a broken record. I don't know about you, but I got a built-in forgetter, and I forget these things so quickly Lord, help me, remind me of what really matters in life because I've realized in and of myself, and thankfully Mary Jo doesn't bring it up to me all the time, but I have a radical self-centeredness in my human heart. I want what I want. Boil it down to silly little things like, I want to watch my TV show, right? It's a sacrifice to go watch The Bachelorette or whatever show it is. Come on, Jesus. And amen. Say, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's a sacrifice for her with all the cop shows I like to watch, you know. I mean, she puts up with me. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. For many of us, even as Christians, if we're completely honest with ourselves, it's not God that stands at the center. It's us. The world revolves around us, right? If church doesn't meet our expectations, ah, there's other churches we could go to if... Anything in life doesn't meet what we want it to. We get grumpy, we get irritable, restless, and discontent because life's supposed to revolve around what we want and what we need, right? Come on, anybody willing to be honest? I see a few heads shaking, right? We're all guilty of it, you know? Some of it's okay, some of it's human nature, but the Bible does show us a different path, a different way. He tells us that something else should really be central and center in our lives. It's something that Paul charged the Corinthian church with. He charged them and told them that this thing that they should be going after, this thing that they should grasp, is should be the matter of first importance in their life. He calls it the gospel, the message of the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, 
of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Paul is telling us that all in life that is good, all in life that is great, all that really matters in this life when it comes down to it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you saved? Are you not saved? Do you believe he is who he says he is? Whether you do or not, it's still a reality. It is still the truth. It'll still determine your ultimate destination in life, right? It's the most important event in history of the world. It's the most important event in each of our lives. It's something that each of us has to make a decision about. It wasn't something that was supposed to be momentary. He says we need to remind ourselves of this continually, that we can't forget about it. When things are going great, we need to remember it. When things are going bad, we need to remember it. When we get that bad report from the doctor, we need to remember it, that Jesus is the savior of the world, that he is the creator of the universe, that he died, that we might have life, that we might be with him forevermore. And when you stand at the foot of the cross, it tends to do something to you. You can't too easily go over here during our altar time or whenever it is and grab the communion elements and stand over here by the cross and be thinking all about yourself and your wants, your needs, and your desires, can you? It starts to change things real quickly when you start to see the nails that were there, right? It changes stuff real quickly. It changes our perspective. It radically begins to shift it. How important is the fight last night when you think about Jesus dying on a cross, right? When you think about his body that was broken that you might have life. When you think about his blood that was shed. So why does he tell us to take communion often as well, right? So that we could remember, so that we get down on our knees at the foot of the cross and we say, God, you are who you said you were. And guess what? I am a vile sinner who forgets about it all too often. Lord, would you help me? Would you ignite me with a passion? I thank you for forgiving me. Would you send me out on mission? Could I tell the world about what you did for me? See, when we forget and we think that we got it all together, what good is it to go tell the world about how wretched and despised you were before you came to know him, right? But when you do, oh my goodness. So I encourage you, it's available each and every week, whether we do it corporately or not. If you have a built-in forgetter like I do, would you please go over there on a regular basis and take communion to remind yourself of just how good God is and how much he loves you. I assure you, things will start to take on a different shape. A perspective in your life will begin to change and ultimately, you'll remember what's really important. In the midst of the darkness, when the lightning starts shining out there and the thunder is rolling over whatever area of your life you're finding difficulty, you can remember that he is the Lord over the thunder and Lord over the lightning and that he is in control of all things that even if bad things happen in a natural sense that should lead even up into your death in a physical sense that you will be thrust into eternity with him where you'll be with the angels in heaven rejoicing, where you'll be with all the saints who have gone before you declaring holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. All those pains will one day go away. We need to keep the reality of those things in our mind because the devil does everything that he can to snuff it out, does he not? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. Man, may we never lose sight of that. May we never stray far from that. May the cross be at the center of our theology. May the cross be at the center of who we are. It'll increase your worship. It'll increase your desire to love him and tell others about him and what he did in our lives. See, there's a great danger in forgetting what's most important. Paul refused to pull away from the gospel. It was his message. He had it on repeat. He played it over and over and over again. It was what changed him and it was what saved many. It was his message. May it be ours as well. He taught other things as well. But he always derived whatever he taught from the foundation that is the gospel. And he always brought it back to that. 
Theologian D.A. Carson writes of Paul, he cannot long talk about Christian joy or Christian ethics or Christian fellowship or the doctrine of God or anything else without finally tying it to the cross. Paul is gospel-centered. He is cross-centered. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, may it be the goal of our lives. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Think about that. You can know every statistic about every football player and win your fantasy football league. Come on, I'm going to win it this year in Jesus' name. And I don't know any of the statistics. <laughs> but you could know all of those. What if we spent the same amount of time digging into God's word as we did into our fantasy football statistics, men? You know, man church is coming up, and I don't see a whole bunch of sign-ups. Come on, Jesus. Ladies, you got these things called boots that you could put on and kick your men in their behind if you need to? The guys are like, I ain't going because he's going to call me out. Yes, we are. God wants men to be men and lead, and he loves us. So I want to encourage you to go online and sign up for that. It's going to be a great morning. We're going to have great fun, but we're going to also speak the truth and love that day. And I certainly hope to see you there that Saturday morning. See, Paul didn't see the gospel as some cold formula. Paul lived the cross-centered life because the cross had saved and transformed him. You see, it's at the foot of the cross where things really begin to get personal in our life, right? That's where we see things for as they really are. And Paul came to this conclusion some 30 years later in writing this to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 14, he says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. It's pretty interesting when you read those words. How many of us as believers, even if we're saved a couple years, would go saying, I was a blasphemer, I was insolent, I was this, I had issues. On the outside, in a worldly sense, Paul was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the smart dude. He was the smartest guy in the room. He was the one that people looked up to in their society and Jewish culture. The Pharisee was like the king. He had a position of authority and people were looking up to him. On the outside, it looked like he had absolutely everything together. But when he came to be confronted with the gospel, he realized how weak he was apart from who Jesus Christ is, and it changed everything about him. Remember, this guy was the Christian killer, right? He was Saul, the one who was going out there persecuting the message of Jesus Christ. But once he was transformed, he went out there and shared the good news of the gospel with everyone that he could. He remembered some 30 years later what he was like. See, those of us who have been saved since we were born, some of us, you know, we sometimes forget how wretched we really are. So you need to come to that understanding before you can really understand the grace of who God is that calls you to your knees and to a place of worship. I think sometimes us addict alcoholic people who live these crazy lives have it just a little bit easier than those of you who didn't suffer from some of the outward stuff that we did. It was easy to look on me and see what a fool I was in those days, right? Eric's out there getting high, Eric's out there getting drunk, Eric's out there in bars, Eric's out there abandoning his family, Eric's out there doing stuff he shouldn't be doing. It was pretty clear to everybody that I was acting a fool, right? But when you're angry, when you're arrogant, when you're prideful, some of those things don't seem to go up the Richter scale, especially if you're pretty prosperous in life. People still look up to you, but guess what? You're just as much a sinner as I was. God doesn't grade on a scale. But Paul also tells us through this that in going to the foot of the cross, we also need to remember what we were like. And if you're still like it, you got some getting saved to do, right? As believers, he wants to transform us from glory to glory. We're saved, but he wants to continue to make us look more like him, right? So when I got into the rooms of AA initially, some 20 plus years ago, they would say, Eric, You've got to roll back the VHS tape every so often and remember just how messed up you are if you want to stay sober. Y'all remember what VHS tapes are? Some of you young people are like, what's a VHS tape? Ask your mom, she'll tell you later. You got to roll back the tape every so often and remember what it was like so that you, lest you go back there, right? 
Because believe me, even 20 plus years later, as a believer in Jesus Christ, there's moments where I'm confronted with the reality of drugs or alcohol, and sometimes they momentarily seem enticing until I remember that I was playing Lord over the toilet bowl, puking every night so that I could get up in the morning, and then it doesn't seem all that attractive as it used to. I was crying like a baby in those days too. Come on, Jesus. There was a joke, joke, half joke, but a, oh, I've got such a bad stomach. I was getting sick all the time. Oh, I'm puking all the time. There's something wrong with me, something all sick. I stopped drinking and all of a sudden I didn't puke for like 10 years. Come on, Jesus. What in the world is that? A, that was the problem. You know? Sometimes we can't see what's going on, right? Our minds want to go off on these fantasies sometimes, right? So they keep legalizing cannabis in all these different places, right? Like, man, I can go to Colorado and smoke weed. It's legal there. Come on, Jesus. It's legal there, right? You can do it. But now that only lasts for maybe 10 or 15 seconds where I entertain something like that because I know the places that something like that would take me. See, those thoughts, if they begin to take root, can ultimately lead to sin down the road if we're not careful. And in the same way, when we forget about who God is in our life, that protection mechanism is gone and we all of a sudden lose the awe and wonder of who he is. And then why do I go gather together with believers? What, you know, why do I need to make a priority of being here on a Sunday morning? You know, why do, you know, why do I need to be in a small group? Why do I need to be wherever? And before you know it, you're out there all by yourself, a perfect target for the enemy. And you're wondering what happened with your relationship with Jesus Christ. And he seems so distant. He's right where he always were. You were the one who drifted away. So Paul gives us great wisdom in his word, and he says, remember the matter of first importance. Put him first in everything we do. So if I were to give you any tips, it goes back to those same things that we've been talking about. Stay in regular attendance in church. Get involved with a small group. Spend time in prayer. Join hands with your spouse if you're married and pray with her. Be around the fellowship of believers. Take communion on a regular basis. And then, and, th- and then what will happen is every area of your life will become an aspect of worship. You'll walk into your workplace and where you might hate being there, all of a sudden you'll begin to see divine appointments and you'll be like, oh my gosh, God has me here for a reason because there's lost flea infested dogs that need to get saved and you were once one of them, right? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Thank you, Lord. Father, I don't know that this message is exactly where I had originally wanted it to go, but I feel you were at work in it. I can't thank you enough for your presence in this place through worship. I can't thank you enough for those who so graciously worshiped you with their tithes and offerings today. And I thank you that you gave me the opportunity this morning to preach the word of God. Father, I pray that it did not fall on deaf ears. I pray that there are those here who might be hurting, those here who might be lost, that Father heard something in this message that gave them hope, something in this message that would draw them closer to you or maybe even into a relationship with you for the first time. If you're here today and you would not call yourself a believer, but you feel something resonating in your heart today, that's the Holy Spirit at work in you, drawing you and calling you into a relationship with the God of the universe. The Bible says that if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that we shall be saved. There may be others of you, you're definitely saved. You're already a believer in Jesus Christ. We don't believe you could lose your salvation here at Journey Church. But if you were honest with where you're at right now, he hasn't been the matter of first importance. Other things have crept in and stolen that place that only he should have. And he's touching you today and you know that you need to repent of those things and you really need help and you need his power to show up. You feel him calling you. You remember what it was like to just be in deep relationship with him and you want that back so badly. Maybe this moment of rededication is that opportunity where God floods into your life, resets your priorities, and you can experience the joy of your salvation all over again. So if that's you today and you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God, would you do me a great favor? I would love to pray for you. Everybody's head's bowed. Nobody's looking around. But if that's you, would you do me a favor and put your hand up real high? I'd love to pray for you. Is there anybody here today that wants to dedicate or rededicate their life to Jesus? I see your hand, sir. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. 
before we move on and pray for him. You know what that tells me? If we're all believers in this place, guys, we have some work to do. Man, every week we need to have people who are far from God here. May he put it on our hearts to go after them aggressively. My brother, would you come on up? If there's anybody else who didn't raise their hand but wanted to, we're not going to embarrass you, but I'd like to pray for you. Come on over here. Give them a big round of applause, church. (laughs) Father, I just stand in the gap with my brother today as he stands at a moment of rededication. Lord, where he's putting his hope and trust in you, and I know he's going through some things right now, and Father, uh, we all need reboots and resets, and sometimes our dedication to you comes through some of the difficult moments in life, and I just pray for this brother right now in these moments that you would shine brightly in his life, Lord God, that he'd be a witness for all who are around him of what you're going to do. Father, we stand in the gap for him in his sickness today, and we ask you, oh God, to heal him in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus, and we as a faith family, we rally around him as well, Lord God, and ask you that you would intervene. You're the creator of the universe. You're the designer of our bodies. Lord, would you bring every cell and to perfect order. And Father, we stand in the gap with him also and just declare over each of us in remembrance today, we remember the matter of first importance that we talked about in scripture today, that Jesus, you are truly the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly, Lord God. And Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. We ask you to make our priorities right. And Lord, we ask you to send us out into the world to live on mission, drawing all men unto you as we lift your name on high. Father, bless the people of Journey Church as they leave this place today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, my brother. God bless you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Go tell the world about who Jesus is.